Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back to Vox Historicus. Today we're going to be taking a look at mass media and the political agenda. We're going to go ahead and start it by going over some of the objectives. We're going to begin by describing how American politicians choreograph their message through the media. We're going to take a look at several key developments within the history of mass media and American politics. We're going to list the major criteria that determines which news stories receive the most media attention. Analyze the impact the media has on what policy issues Americans think about. We're going to also explain how policy entrepreneurs employ media strategies to influence the public agenda. And lastly, we're going to go ahead and assess the impact of mass media on the scope of government and democracy in America, as we always do for the past couple of months now here in the U.S. government. All right, let's go ahead and... Now, as we get started, here are some of the guided questions as you watch that I'll have you go over. Now, we're going to go ahead and take a look at how media and its role in politics have actually changed since the 1800s. Make sure you look that up. Now, media has also been regulated by the U.S. since its inception. So take a look at how media has been regulated by the U.S. How has cable television, the Internet, all these new technologies, and private control of the media shaped the issues the modern media has provided us? How is the news gathered by the news organizations and presented to the public? Now, you're also going to be taking a look at bias, bias within the media. There's been much talk about how uh, the media has been very liberal. Uh, as a matter of fact, Trump has made his accusations as um, the media is rigged by the liberal uh, uh, group and uh, the Democrats. So you need to ask yourself, how is bias present in the news and what are the reasons for such bias in the news? Now... Also, take a look at how media shapes the feelings of the public over different issues and how it affects you, how it socializes you. And lastly, does the media influence the scope of government and individualism in the political process? Now, these are just some of the questions I'll have you take a look at uh, during this lecture. So let's go ahead and let's get started. And by taking a look at a mass media overview. Now, the media acts as a key linkage institution between the people and policymakers. Now, it has a profound impact on the pol political policy agenda. The American political system has entered a new period of high-tech politics in which the behavior of citizens and policymakers, as well as the political agenda itself, is increasingly shaped by technology. And we see that with the further development of social networking and in its involvement in politics. The mass media is a key part of the technology. Television, radio, newspapers, magazines, and other means of popular communication are called mass media because they reach out and profoundly influence not only the elites, but the public masses throughout the nation. Mass media today. Now, modern political success depends upon the control of mass media. We've seen that during the campaign of 2016. Candidates have actually learned that one way to guide the media's focus is to limit what they report onto carefully scripted events. These events are also known as media events. That is, events that are staged primarily for the purpose of being covered. Image making does not stop with the campaign. It is also a critical element in a day-to-day -day governing since politicians' images in the press are seen as good indicators of their clout. For example, the Reagan administration was particularly effective in controlling the president's image as presented by the media. A large part of today's so-called 30-second presidency, a reference to a 30-second soundbite on TV, is the likely, uh, is strictly produced TV commercial. As you can see here is a little um, image of uh, President Obama during his door-to-door uh, -door campaigning of uh, 2008 I think it could possibly be his re-election of 2012. Now, here's figure 7.1 detailing the importance journalists assign to various roles of the mass media. You can take a look at the high number reflecting investigate claims made by the government and the least uh, influential is providing entertainment. Here's another uh, image of White House Press Secretary. Uh, battling daily with the press corps as correspondents obtain more and more information while the president's spokesperson tries to control the news agenda. Now, reviewing the development of media politics. It begins with Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933 and 1945, 
he was the first president to actually use the media effectively. We've all learned in, of course, U.S. history about his fireside chats. To Roosevelt, the media was a potential ally, and he promised reporters two press conferences or presidential meetings with reporters a week. At the time Roosevelt's administration, the press had not yet started to report on a political leader's private life. That was still taboo. The press never a even reported to the American public that the president was actually confined to a wheelchair. The events of the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal soared, soured, sorry, 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 soured the press on government. Today's newspeople work in an environment of cynicism. The press sees ferreting out the truth as their job since they believe that politicians rarely tell the whole story. Investigative journalism, though, is the use of detective-like reporting methods to unearth scandals, pit reporters against political leaders. There is evidence that actually TV fondness for investigative journalism has contributed to the greater public cynicism and negativism of politics. You can also cite that as one of the reasons that possibly trust and confidence has declined in the past 50 years, and that in itself resulting in low voter turnout. Now, beginning with print media, the first American daily newspaper was actually printed in Philadelphia in 1783, but daily newspapers did not, come, did not become common until the technological advances of the mid-19th century. Rapid printing and cheap paper made the penny press. Yes, the penny press. Possible, a paper that could be bought for a penny and read at home. By the 1840s, though, the telegraph permitted a primitive wire service which relayed news stories from city to city faster than ever before. The AP, also known as the Associated Press, which was founded in 1849, depended heavily on this new technology. Two newspaper magnates, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, enlivened journalism around the turn of the century. This was the era known as yellow journalism, where the main topics were sensationalized accounts of violence, corruption, wars, and gossip. We went over this during U.S. history. Well, you should have gone over it during U.S. history. Newspapers consolidated into chains during the early part of the 20th century. Now, what are chains? Well, chains are groups of newspapers published by media conglomerates and today accounting for four-fifths of the nation's daily newspaper circulation. Today's massive media conglomerates control newspapers with 78% of the nation's daily circulation. These chains often control te television and radio stations as well. Among the most influential newspapers today, though, are the New York Times, the Washington Post, and a couple of pages, uh, sorry, papers from major cities like, for example, the Chicago Tribune or the LA Times. For most newspapers in medium-sized and small towns, the main source of national world news is, of course, the Associated Press Wire Service, AP Wire Service. Magazines, on the other hand, the political content of leading magazines is pretty slim. News weeklies such as Time, Newsweek, and the U.S. News and World Report rank well behind popular favorites such as Reader's Digest, TV Guide, and National Geographic. Serious magazines of political news and opinion such as the New Republic and the National Review and Commentary are primarily read by the educated elite, though. Personally, I've never really read either one of those. Not that I consider myself elite, though. The emergence of radio and television. The broadcast media has generally displaced the print media as Americans' principal source of news and information. Keep that in mind. Radio was actually invented in 1903. The first modern commercial radio station was actually Pittsburgh's KDKA, whose first broadcast was of the 1920 Hardy Cox presidential election returns. We continue with the emergence of radio and television as... For the broadcast media has generally displaced the print media as Americans' principal source of news and information. In the 1950s and 60s, there were the adolescent years for American television. As a form of technology, television is almost as old as radio. The first television station actually appeared in 1931. The first televised presidential debate was the 1960 Kennedy-Nixon debate. And we all know about that one and how impressive Kennedy looked as to the run-down, sweaty Nixon look. Now, the polls actually results from this debate illustrate the visual power of television in America's politics. Whereas people's listening to the radio gave the edge to Nixon, those who saw it on television thought Kennedy won. 
Now, television took the nation to the war in Vietnam during the 1960s, and TV exposed governmental naivete. Some said it was actually outright lying about the progress of the war. President Johnson, who had two wars on his hands, one in Vietnam and the other one at home with anti-war protesters, both covering in detail by the media. Here's a short article on media and politics. Please read. Now, regulation of electronic media or, or what say media itself begins with the FCC or the creation thereof. The FCC or the Federal Communications Commission regulates the use of airwaves. We need to keep that in mind of what this regulatory agency is. First, it prevents near monopoly control of the market. Number two, the review, the performance of stations, and number three, issues fair treatment rules for politicians. Usually the fair treatment rules for politicians, uh, I believe, well, we'll talk about it more in just a second. First, to prevent near monopolies of control over a broadcast market, the FCC has instituted rules to limit the number of stations either owned or controlled by one company, limiting the size of chains. Secondly, the FCC conducts periodic examinations of the goals and performance of the stations as part of its licensee authority. Congress long ago stipulated that in order to receive a broadcasting license, a station must serve the public interest. The FCC has only one rare occasion withdrawn licenses for failing to do so, as when a Chicago station lost its license for neglecting informational programs and for presenting obscene movies. And lastly, third, the FCC has issued a number of fair treatment rules concerning access to airways for politi political candidates and office holders. The equal time rule stipulates that if a station sells advertising time for one candidate, it must be willing to sell equal time to other candidates for the same office. And the right of reply rule states if a person is attacked on a broadcast other than the news, then that person has the right to reply via the same station. Now, from broadcasting to narrowcasting, the rise of cable and cable news, with the growth of cable TV and a variety of cable news networks such as CNN or the Cable News Network, television has actually entered a new era of bringing news to the people and to the political leaders as it happens. However, scholars criticize cable news for its lack of deep news value and in-depth reporting. Broadcast news viewership continues to decline due to competition with cable news, the Internet, and other new technologies. I mean, we just heard the other day that Facebook is going to be getting into the news industry by creating a new Facebook news site. Increasingly, though, narrowcasting has replaced broadcasting, meaning stations target particularly narrow audiences. Now, what is narrowcasting? Narrowcasting is a media program on cable TV or Internet that is focused on one topic and aimed at a particular audience or demographic. Cable TV news channels can bring the news to people and political leaders as it happens. What has been the impact of the Internet? Well, the impact of the Internet, the great availability for those who are politically interested to access limitless amounts of information through the Internet and specialized narrowcasts, combined with the ability of those who are uninterested to avoid news of any kind while using the media, is increasing the division between the knowledgeable and the apathetic. Internet facilities communication about politics in every conceivable direction. The potential to inform American politics, Americans about politics, Internet is propulsive. People choose what to learn about. Blogs provide additional information about the news stories and commentary. Now, here's a table 7.1 representing the top 25 LICO searches for the week of the first 2008 debate. Private control of the media has actually expanded, though the FCC has regulated to its best. Because of private ownership of the media and the First Amendment right to free speech, American journalists have long had an unfettered capacity to criticize government leaders and policies. Although the American media are independent when it comes to journalism content, they are totally dependent on advertising revenues to keep their businesses going. Private ownership means that getting the biggest possible audience is the primary indeed, sometimes the only objective. That's why I keep saying that drama sells. If drama sells and that's what you're looking for, for sales, then you must, in, I guess, put out the most drama you possibly can. Media in America today tend to be part of a large conglomerate. In the newspaper business, 
Chains such as Gannett, Knight, and Riddler, and Newhouse control newspapers that together represent 80% of the nation's daily circulation. Overview of the modern news. News reporting is a business in America in which profits shape how journalism define what is newsworthy, where they get their information, and how they present to it. Edward Jane Epstein found that at too large extent, TV networks define news as what is entertaining to the average viewer. Finding the news, actually identifying what is news. Now, a surprising amount of news comes from well-established sources. Most news organizations assign their best reporters to a particular beat. What is a beat? Well, a beat is a specific location from which news frequently emanates, like Congress or the White House. Now, we call those the White House correspondents for those that are located in the White House. They have a very beautiful event that occurs once a year called the White House Correspondent Dinner. It's usually led by the president and the White House correspondents, and the moderator is usually a comedian. Most years now, recently, has been a comedian. I believe last year with, was with Seth Meyers, and the year before was with uh, Kevin Hart, and, and so on. Numerous studies of both the electronic and print media have found that journalists rely almost exclusively on such established sources to get their information. Edward James Epstein found that to large extent, TV networks define news as what is entertaining to the average viewer. They begin to make judgments for us. Now, those who make the news depend on the media to spread certain information and ideas to the general public, and sometimes via the form of trial balloons. Trial balloons. Trial balloons are an intentional news leak for the purpose of assessing political reaction, or as they call it, a leak. In turn, reporters rely on public officials to keep them informed. Reporters and their sources depend on each other for stories and to get them out. Official sources who have the information, such as knowledge about movements during the Gulf War, usually have the upper hand over those who merely report it. Now, very little of the news is generated by spontaneous events or a reporter's own analysis. Most stories are actually drawn from situations over which newsmakers have substantial control over. Despite this dependence on familiar sources, reporters occasionally have an opportunity to live up to the image of the crusading truth seeker. For example, going back in time to local reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward of the Washington Post, who uncovered important evidence in the Watergate case leading up to Richard Milhouse Nix's uh, forced resignation. Of course, he was forced because he was facing criminal conviction and impeachment. Colonists like Jack Anderson regularly exposed governmental corruption and efficiency. The Watergate scandal signaled a new era in the relationship between journalists and politicians. Journalists actually began to assume that politicians had something to hide, and politicians assumed that reporters were out to embarrass them. However, Nixon would later on repair his relationship with the media when he would sit down with a certain English... <laughs> I forgot the name of the reporter. Um, it's actually a movie also. Uh, Richard Nixon and... I'll get back to you on that one, guys. I completely just forgot about that one there. All right. Now, here's a picture of David Blue, a reporter for NBC uh, News. Uh, very much involved in the uh, 2003 Iraqi war, right in the middle of it. Now, presenting the news superficially describes most news coverage today. Once the news has been found, it has to be compressed into a 30-second news segment or fit into among the advertisements in the newspaper. TV news is actually little more than headline service. With exceptions like NewsHour, PBS, and Nightline ABC, Analysis of news events rarely last more than a minute. At the same time, complex issues like nuclear power, the nation's money supply, population, I'm sorry, pollution, are actually difficult to treat in a short news clip. They require more of a longer story or possibly even a documentary. Paradoxically, though, paradoxically, as technology has enabled the media to pass along information with greater speed, news coverage has actually become less complete. Americans now hear sound bites on TV constantly. And again, I remind you, short video clips of approximately 10, 20 seconds at the most. Major TV networks have actually devoted less time to covering political candidates, though. However, in a campaign season, that is very untrue. We get to the bias in the news. 
Of course, we can't deny that there's bias in news. Many people actually believe the news is biased in favor of one point of view. We've talked about that quite consist consistently here in class, how MSNBC may come off liberal. CNBC actually came off quite liberal during the Republican uh, debate recently. Now Fox News, of course, very conservative in control of Ru Rudolph Murdoch. Now, generally is not very biased towards a particular I ideology. I'm sorry, news is not generally very biased towards a particular ideology. However, news reporting is biased towards to what will draw the largest audience, such as a good pictures and negative reporting. Again, drama. The, jar the charge that media has had a liberal bias has become a familiar one in American politics. Liberal media, liberal media this, liberal media that. And there is sometimes limited evidence to support that. Actually, national reporters are more likely to call themselves liberal than the general public. In a 2002 survey of 1,149 journalists, found that 37% identified themselves as Democrat, compared to 19% who said that they were Republicans. However, there is little reason to believe that journalists' personal attitudes sway the reporting of the news. Most stories are actually presented in a point-to-counterpoint format in which two opposing points of the view are presented. The news is typically characterized by political neutrality. Most reporters actually strongly believe in journalistic objectivity. Those who are the best at objective reporting are usually rewarded by their editors. Media outlets have actually direct financial stake in attracting viewers and subscribers. Well, then a conclusionary statement would be in regards to the news reporting containing little explicit partisan or ideological bias is not to argue that it does not distort reality in its own coverage, though. Structural bias may be more prevalent than ideological bias, as only certain items may be covered. Ideally, though, the news should mirror reality. In practice, though, there are too many potential stories for this case to be for this to be the case. Journalists must select which stories to cover and what to decree. Due to economic pressures, though, the media are biased in favor of stories with high drama that will attract people's interest rather than extended analysis of complex issues. Television is particularly biased towards stories that generate good pictures, seeing a good talking head. Talking head, whoa. A shot of a person's face talking directly to the camera is actually boring and viewers will switch channels if search of more interesting visual stimulation. Here's another photo of a conservative Republican known as George H.W. Bush. Of course, your 42nd, 41st president, sorry, 41st president. Table 7.2 will describe to you stories citizens have turned tuned in and tuned out. The news and public opinion. Just finishing a whole chapter on public opinion recently in Unit 2, we saw several different uh, thoughts and concepts. But when we are in conjunction with media, the media can actually affect what Americans think about. By increasing political attention, I'm sorry, public attention to specific problems, the media influence how the pub public evaluates p political leaders by emphasizing one event over the other. The media can have an effect on how the public evaluates specific events. It is difficult to study the effects of the news media on people's opinion and behavior, though. One reason is that it's hard to separate the media from other influences. In addition, the effect of one news story on public opinion may be negligible, while cumulative effect of dozens of news stories may be quite important. Now, there's evidence that the news and its presentations are important in shaping public opinion about political issues. The decision to cover or to ignore certain issues can affect public opinion. By focusing public attention on a specific problem, the media influences the criteria by which the public evaluates its leaders. There's also some evidence that people's opinions shift when the tone of the news coverage, with the news, tone of the news coverage. Popular presidents prompt the public to support policies. The most powerful influence is that of the news commentators on public opinion. Much remains unknown about the effects of the media and the news on American political behavior, though. Enough is known, however, to conclude that the media is a key political institution. Policy Entrepreneurs and the Agenda Setting The media acts as a key linkage institution between the people and the policymakers and have a profound impact on the political policy agenda. People are actually trying to influence the government's policy agenda when they confront government officials with problems they expect to solve. Interest groups, political parties, politicians, including the President and Congress, 
public relations firms, and bureaucratic agencies are all pushing for their priorities to take precedence over others. Political activists, often called policy entrepreneurs, people who invest their political capital in an issue, depend heavily upon the media to get their ideas placed high on the governmental agenda. Now, a policy entrepreneur is a person in and out of government who invests their political capital in an issue that they want on the policy agenda. Policy entrepreneurs' weapons include press releases, press conference, letter writing, button-holding reporters and columnists, and trading personal contacts. People in power can also use a leak, a carefully placed bit of inside information that is given to a friendly reporter. Or a trial balloon. Now, the staging of political events to attract media attention is a political art form. Important political events, such as Nixon's famous trip to China, was orchestrated minute by minute with an eye on American TV audiences. It is not the only city who has successfully used the media. Civil rights group in the 1960s relied heavily on the media to tell their stories of unjust treatment. Many believe that the introduction of television actually helped to accelerate movement by graphically showing Americans in both the North and the South what the station was. Conveying a large-term positive image with, via the media is more important than a few dramatic events, though. Policy entrepreneurs depend on goodwill and good images. Public relation firms may be hired to improve a group or individual's image and its ability to sell its policy positions. Understanding mass media, and we look at to assess the media and the scope of government. Well, media, of course, is the watchdog function of the media. It helps us keep the government small. Media as a watchdog restricts politicians. Many observers feel that the press is biased against whomever holds office and reporters want to expose them in the media. With every new proposal being met with skepticism, regular constraints are placed on the growth of government. And the watchdog orientation of the press can be characterized as neither liberal nor conservative, but reformists. When they focus on injustice in society, the media inevitably encourages the growth of government. Media reports probably enforce government to address it, which expands the scope of government. Once the media identifies a problem in the society, reporters usually begin to ask what the government is doing about it. The media portray government as responsible handling for almost every major problem. So when it comes to understanding the mass media, individualism and the media, the rise of television has actually furthered individualism in the American political process. Candidates are now much more capable of running for office in their own by appealing to people directly through television. Easier to focus on one person like the president. I mean, it's just one person. Then groups like Congress or the courts. Courts are actually nine. Congress is about 535. Congress is difficult to cover on television because there's uh, 535 members, like I just previously mentioned. I forgot I had typed it on there. But there's only one president, so the presidency has increasingly received more exposure vis-a-vis -vis the government. I mean, I'm sorry, Congress. Democracy in the media. <clears throat> Information is the fuel of democracy, but news provides more entertainment than information and superficial at times. The rise of the informational society has not brought about the rise of the informed society, actually. What I mean by that is, has media either made us smarter or dumber? The media does much a better job of covering the horse race aspect of politics and covering actual substantial issues, and we've seen that constantly, specifically utilized with tools such as polls. Now lastly, News is a business, giving people what they want. With the media's superficial treatment of important policy issues, it is not surprising that the incredible amount of information available to Americans today has not visibly increased their political awareness or participation. The media's defense is to say that it is what the people want. Network executives claim that they are in business to make profit, and to do so, they have to appeal to the maximum number of people and what sells. Thank you for listening today, ladies and gentlemen. Do appreciate it. Moving on to our next lecture next time on political parties.